Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Nancy Van Antwerp. I'm one of the members of the committee. And uh, it's going to be my pleasure to introduce Ellie Kennard to you. Many of you probably know her better than I do. But when we were meeting to talk about who could be a keynote speaker, um, we, her name came up. And as it happened, she had been the state senator for my district. Um, being new to North Carolina, I didn't really know her very well. She'd already resigned before I became much aware of who she was. But we had the pleasure of uh, actually meeting this morning, and she gave me uh, some biographical information about her. She's originally from Minnesota, but she's been in North Carolina since 1964, a very long time. Raised a family of three sons and now has three grandchildren uh, as well. She was mayor of Carborough for eight years, and while she was mayor, she went to law school and became uh, an attorney that uh, worked on North Carolina prisoner legal services and also private practice. After being mayor, she ran for the state senate, and she served in the state senate for 17 years. And interestingly, her district changed. I don't know if it was gerrymandered or not, but it changed over the years. So she <coughs> had many, many different counties at different times, and the final district that she had was Chatham and Orange County. Uh, she, uh, while she was in the um, state senate, she worked on a lot of progressive issues, issues like campaign finance reform, um, <coughs> abolition of the death penalty, environmental issues, and other social justice issues. She has been recognized for her service by the North Carolina Council of Churches, um, I guess North Carolina Women's Attorneys Organization, Sierra Club and People of Faith Against the Death Penalty. In uh, 2013, she uh, resigned from her position with the uh, State Senate to work on various, well, the voter uh, ID project. And she will be telling you uh, more about that as she speaks uh, now and also in the workshop later on. So it's my pleasure to introduce our <coughs> keynote speaker, Ellie Kennard. I moved a little closer because um, I'm 82 and I live in a retirement community and I see that there are many people like me who probably could use being a little closer. So I'm being closer and I, I can project because um, I was a politician for many, many years. So thank you very much for inviting me to join you on this very, very important topic. <clears throat> Um, and we, as we exercise our obligations as citizens and as people of faith, we remember Jesus' admonition to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but we also know that he instructed us to take care of the least of these. In our country and our society, too often the least of these has not been at the forefront of our actions, as we heard from our wonderful introduction and devotion. <clears throat> Our government is too often at the service of those with the most, not the least. I'm going to have a little bit of trouble here because it's pollen season, <clears throat> but we're going to make it through. <clears throat> so their lawmaking too often gives to the wealthy who do not need any help and skimp on help for those who desperately need it. Those at the top hire lobbyists to walk the halls of the legislature, as Ellen knows well and of course are in the same network of influence outside the halls. And so things that happened this last term when I was in the legislature to me are a very disturbing indication that we have left service for the least of these and turned our back on those who need our help the most. I'm going to give you some examples. Now I think probably everybody here is watching the Roosevelts and we can see what government can do for the least of these. But I'm going to give you some examples of what happened that did not help the least of these, in fact, hurt them. Mobile homes and manufactured homes are the largest stock for housing for poor people. They raised the tax, the sales tax, on mobile homes and manufactured homes by 300%. You heard me, 300%. They didn't do that for yachts 
or for airplanes. So what happened to the least of these when housing is a basic need? Small loans and these sort of storefront financial uh, agencies that are we see. Even louder? Okay. How's that? I'm a little closer. We should have filled the front rows. This is not church. <laughs> I'll do that. So if you and I go to get a loan, we can go to any bank and we can get one for 6 or 7%. Six or seven percent. I don't know exactly how much that is. Those people who go for these small loans, $1,000 or $4,000, now pay 30% interest. 30%. And of course, they're struggling already, and so if they fall back on their payments, they have to pay fees and penalties. They end up very often paying more than what they originally borrowed. The earned income tax credit, which is started by Reagan as the way, best way to help the poor, for instance, was repealed, along with the estate tax, which has served, I think, 123 people in North Carolina. What are we doing for the least of the least? And you know, our public policy and our faithful policy is expressed through government actions and by citizens coming together to give those without a voice, give them our voice and our actions. The antidote to power of the money, who, money to wield their influence in the halls of Congress and the legislature is the ballot box. But when government reduces access to the ballot box through election laws that strip them of it, that is not taking care of the least of these. Sadly, we have seen that election access reduced with, I think, callous disregard to the consequences. And we have to be vigilant. You today are being vigilant. Just this week, an ad that could be misleading, and I see Bob Hall has arrived, about voter ID was put onto the airways and only somewhat quickly corrected. And that ad said, I am Phil Berger, and I introduced and got passed a photo ID bill. Well, what he forgot to say was, you won't need it until 2016. How many people, as we're approaching closer and closer to the election, realize they don't have that ID and will simply stay away? So, what do we do? We have to get out there and inform people on the streets, in the libraries, in Walmart, everywhere. But I'm not here, nor are you, to condemn these people who put these ads, that's the game, but rather through our works as well as our faith that we can overcome and we will protect the least of these and we will urge our government to serve all and remember that is their role. I have a personal connection to voting rights because I was the author and co-author and co-sponsor of many of these bills that expanded our election laws. And I can tell you that Bob Hall, whom you're going to hear from, was the person who walked the halls day after day, who got together those bills that changed radically the access to the ballot. And he's going to tell you that we were one of the lowest and then we became one of the highest because of all these. So I watched with absolute dismay as these laws were repealed with very thin excuses. And so we went from one of the lowest to the highest, and now we're back. And so voter projects like yours and these churches are very important. I resigned to work with the churches, and I'm sad to say it didn't work very well. We were starting in January when people weren't paying much attention. And what we asked was, if people would, get, and we worked with black churches and white churches all across the state, if they would make sure their own members were registered, and actually most church members are registered to vote and are actively participating. But then we had these little kids, and we said, would you go out into your own neighborhoods, just collect the information about people in your own neighborhood, and you don't need to go to a mobile home park or across the state, and find out, first of all, if they were registered, if not, register them. Tell them where their precinct was, and we're going to hear about that in a minute, and if they needed help. Um, sadly, I couldn't get anybody to do it. I came out, 
of the democratic experience, you know, just working for the party and my own candidacy, I thought everybody liked to canvass. Everybody liked to go out into their neighborhoods or other neighborhoods. Didn't happen. But in the meantime, there were many, many other groups, and we actually gave everything to a couple of other groups, Democracy North Carolina. But for instance, um, these are people working on campuses, and so there are people working all over on campuses. And then this is from a, a low-income health clinic, and they are talking with their folks. So there are many, many people who are really working very hard. Uh, but with the misinformation out there, and with things like the precinct change, things are happening such that people are not going to either get out to vote or are not, their vote's not going to be counted. So many people like you are working to overcome these obstacles and make sure that people are registered to vote and get to the polls in the correct precinct on election day. Training in the new laws and what each of us can do to make that pledge come true will make a difference and you're going to hear a lot of what Bob is doing. So I'm going to describe the changes in the election laws and the groups that are most affected by the change as well as the lawsuits and you're going to hear about that and more. Right? Now the short title of the bill was the Voter Verification Information Verification Act and it started out came out of the House, was very short, and they had a lot of things you could use for the voter IT. But in the meantime, the Senate held the bill up for a long, long time. And then the Supreme Court did not do any of us a favor. They gutted part of the Voter, um, the voter Rights Act, and so the, the Senate sprang into action. Now, I'm here in a nonpartisan, in a 5013C nonpartisan capacity, but I'm just telling you some of the facts. So it went from five pages to 46 pages. And as you can see, all sorts of things. And I would go through this, and I would call the elections board, and I would call Bob, and I would say, what does this mean? What does this mean? When I first called the elections board, they said, frankly, they didn't know yet because they were still working on trying to figure it out. But what happened was really an attack on the access to the ballot here. So, on the floor, when I said, you know, you want to talk about photo ID and, and making sure there's no fraud, that's fine, but what are all these other 40 pages for? And of course, that's what we know it was. So, now I want to put this a little bit into context. This U.S. Supreme Court has allowed states to write their own voting and election laws. And we were not unique in some of these things or on some of the things they're taking away. Um, a lot of states have early voting, but a lot of them don't, and, but ours was the most generous. Some have straight party ticket voting and some don't. Some have same day registration. So what happened will be part of the lawsuit, and you'll hear about that. But we were not that unique because of this right of the states to write everything. Now, here's another one. I can tell you that the voter ID, photo ID, is here to stay. 72% and still that high, people approve of requiring a photo ID when you vote. So even if the legislature turned over this fall, which is not going to, that probably would not be overturned. Now, there are interesting little wrinkles to this. In order to get social services such as food stamps and TANF, which is welfare, now they are required, and unemployment, I think, they're now required to have a photo ID. So a lot of those people that we've been very concerned over not getting a photo ID may have one, and that will help a good bit. So what about these changes? And how do they affect each group? And you're going to hear throughout the day more about that. I think one of the saddest, although they're all sad, is that we used to have early registration for 16 and 17 year olds in their high school classes. And they could pre-register so that at 18, they could just walk in the door and vote. And it was a wonderful system. It was a great civics lesson, a great uh, lesson in, in, in citizenship. Why would they take that away when we want to teach our children to be responsible citizens and to participate in forming their own government? 
So that was gone in September of last year. Some people got right on it, went into the schools, and were able to register a lot of them. But you know, this is a big state. So in 2014, the big changes came. And they're up there, and they're also at, at the, just the, the sort of outline scale. First of all, no same-day registration. Now, you can still register at early voting, um, or you can change within your precinct on election day. I'll tell you who that really is going to affect, and most people don't think about this, but I'm from Chapel Hill with the university. That's really going to affect college and university students. You know, they're not paying attention. They've got a paper due. They've got an exam. They've got something to think about for Saturday night. And all of a sudden, election day is a season is a month, and they have not registered to vote 30 days before. But in the past, they could go to early voting and register and vote at the same day. It was a huge opportunity for our students. Again, good citizenship, participation in government. How sad this is. And it did affect other groups, too, some of it, African Americans. But I think students are going to be the most affected. Now, no straight party ticket voting. Well, on the floor, they said you really, really should know who you're voting for, have researched them, have done everything. Well, I'm not going to ask anybody to identify themselves. How many people know what the Council of Government is? My test is, yeah, we know some of you are very involved and very active and whatnot. It's the insurance commissioner, the treasurer, the agriculture commissioner, labor, all that sort of thing. Most people have no idea who they are. My test is go to Walmarts, ask the first 10 people you see, what is the council of state, and then ask the next 10 to name one. The point is that we all are flooded with advertising from the president and from the Senate and Congress and somewhat of the legislature. But these folks do not have the money and they don't spend the money that they have got on TV advertising. Some will come through the mail. But most people have no idea. So this is what we call down ballot drop off. People just stop voting. Well, when you had a party designation, now the president's always been separate. But when you have a party designation, you could say, I have no idea who these people are, what they stand for, what they do even. But I do know that they believe in my goals and my values because they're the same party that I am. So if you put an X at the top of the ballot with a D or an R or an L, you knew that those people were going to represent what you wanted them to do when they got to the government. And we do know, from the, as part of the lawsuits, that African Americans in particular have been affected by this, and it has a disparate impact on their voting. Next biggie, early voting has been shortened by one week, and then we go back to the students. It was a great help, and a lot of the campuses across the state had early voting sites. Sadly, many of those are gone. But when you shorten it by one week, you cut out completely the souls to the polls, which the African-American churches used heavily. After church service, they would get a bus, and they would take everybody to the polls, and they would vote. This is going to greatly reduce, we think, the African-American vote, and that is part of the lawsuits because of the disparate impact on a protected class. A protected class in the law is those who um, are, have a disparate impact because of something that the government did, and gender, age, uh, race, that sort of thing. Now, this is going to affect everybody. If you go to the wrong precinct on election day, your vote is not counted. It is thrown in the wastebasket. And I think, Bob, you just found how many 470 people didn't have their votes counted. Again, this is African Americans, they have found has a disparate statistical impact on them. So those changes, those are major changes, and they're going to greatly affect everybody there. Now there's some other things that will affect it, but not as great an impact as that. The parties have always had the opportunity to put two people in every precinct. Is it two people in, of each party or one of each party? Yeah. in each precinct to sort of watch what goes on and to challenge anybody they think is not 
uh, registered or in the wrong precinct or whatever. Well, now they have got 10 more in each county who can go around and we're afraid they're going to be harassment occurring in these situations. Now, this has been chaos from what I understand. The poll workers in 14 will ask people, and if you've been there, if you have a photo ID. And it's all over the map. We've sort of checked with what different people, different, and the reason is poll workers are volunteers. They're good citizens who volunteer there. But training is essential. And these changes in the law are such that they ask, some people said you had to sign something. Some, I've heard even people say you had to have one. Uh, and, and some people just say, now, um, it, forget the 16 and whatnot. It's going to happen again in the fall. But remember, as all of you do, because you're informed people, but tell everybody, you don't need that photo ID until 2016. We're very worried that there's been so much um, hype about this that people will stay away because they think that they have to have that and they realize they haven't gotten that. But what we really have to remember is that it also could be affected in subtle ways. Long line, the person at the poll who's working the poll says, do you have a photo ID? The guy at the end of the line hears that and turns around and goes home because they don't have it. So we, we're very concerned that all of this is going to have a cumulative effect. Now, this is a sad one. We got public financing for the judicial candidates, the appellate candidates, and for the Council of State. Remember that crazy outfit that nobody knows about. And the reason we wanted that was that judges should not be out raising money from the very people whom they are going to hear their cases. So that was so important. And the same is true of, of the Council of State. The treasurer in the past had to get money from the very people they were regulating. The insurance commissioner gets money from the insurance industry because they want to make sure that they, you know. So that is a really bad one. Stand by your ad was repealed. Now we still have it in the federal courts, but that was a wonderful thing. You know, Joe Blow could say, I'm, I'm running for this office and this other person is a scoundrel and I stand by this ad. No more, and you don't know unless you're a policy wonk and go look up who the people were who paid for the ad. You're not going to know. Unlimited spending between the campaigns without disclosure. And the individual contribution limit is now raised to $5,000. Now, absentee voting, very interesting. No photo ID is required for absentee voting. Interesting. We know across the United States where fraud occurred was in absentee voting. Now you, and it's a, it's a somewhat cumbersome process. You have to download, and that's the only place you can get it, unless you photocopy the um, application. And what you're doing when you mail it in is an application. And then they send you back the ballot. And then you have two witnesses, or one if it's notarized. Those two witnesses can be your son-in-law and the garbage man. Big deal. Photo ID at the polls? Nothing. They're comparable to that. So that is a real, real disappointing change among all these others. Then we get to 2016. And as I say, when the bill, bill came over from the House to the Senate, they had a long list of what could be considered acceptable government-issued photo ID. All that went out the window after the Supreme Court um, Section 5 Voting Right Act. So now it's a very narrow list. An unexpired driver's, North Carolina driver's license or a learner's permit or provisional license. Now, you can also get what's called a non-operator's license, and any, a lot of elderly people get these. And um, people who've been in prison and have completed their sentence. The homeless, a lot of these get these. And so they're going to need that. And there are provisions for people who can, who can get a free ID and a free marriage and birth certificate. But they have to prove they are registered and attended. So, but interestingly, there are no Department of Motor Vehicle offices in Jones and Warren counties. So what are you going to do? You're going to go a whole other county. And some of these counties are spread way out. So you can have an unexpired passport. How many people living in mobile homes have an unexpired passport. 
military, anything goes, no expiration date, veterans, anything goes. And then here's an interesting one, federally and state recognized tribal IDs if signed by an officer of the tribe. Isn't that an interesting thing? Now here's another real interesting wrinkle. If you are 70 years old, on your birthday, if you have a, a driver's license or one of these, you can use that to vote for life. Well, why would they make this wonderful exception for older people? Well, they didn't want the AARP down on them. They would have killed their bill. So these are things that are very important for people to understand. Now, an out-of-state license, again, I go back to my students, an out-of-state license is fine for the first time if you register to vote 90 days before the election. Now, how many people are going to figure that one out? You're going to hear more about the impact on voters. I've talked about them as I've gone along. But these are things that are cumulative. So we know that there is an impact on all of these areas and all of these people. And of course what we're going to have is we're going to have uh, lawsuits that they, we'd hope there'd be an injunction so this wouldn't go into effect before this election, but that, that didn't happen. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some interesting things. Some people, the parties, have figured out how to game the system. I told you about absentee ballots, didn't need any particular identification, just a couple of witnesses. All, both parties have lists of donors, people who have given them money. And they have their address, and they can print them out on address labels. They get a stack of absentee ballots, and they have these little parties where they stick all their donors' names, and then they send them to their, and then those are mailed back to them, and they automatically have voted when they vote absentee. So they're gaming the system. Now, a couple of interesting facts. 500,000 more Democrats than Republicans voted in 2012, but we lost due to the gerrymandering of the districts, which you're going to hear about in a few minutes. 800,000 women who voted in 2008, 800,000 in North Carolina, didn't vote in 12. And so we've had a lot of these organizations that are uh, ad hoc sending letters to, they get those lists, and now of course we're into the 10, uh, 12 and 14. But this is an off-year election, and that may happen again. 450,000 African Americans voted in eight and didn't vote in 10. And something that I think is really, really interesting, 26% of voters are not affiliated with either party. And that's increasing every year as young people are not affiliating with a party. So various groups are doing things like yours, getting people registered to vote. And there are a lot of groups now that have paid interns. And of course, that was a big difference between what we did and what they are doing. They really, that makes a difference. So now we have a lawsuit. They've been in combined into one federal lawsuit. And the League of Women Voters, some of you may be league members, um, and the NAACP, and the third one is uh, the Southern Coalition. Are they the third? Yeah. A. Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph, yeah. And these are now combined into a federal lawsuit. Do we think we will win? Very iffy. They have to prove intention. And so there have been a flurry of um, freedom of information and other uh, requirements con connected with the lawsuit to get emails between the staff and the legislators who passed these bills. They're looking for a smoking gun, which is very hard. Is somebody going to really say, yeah, we did this to disenfranchise um, African Americans, women, students, that was our purpose. Now, every once in a while they'd have one of these crazies around the state uh, who did say that, who said, we are doing that on purpose. And they got rid of that person as fast as they possibly could. I've forgotten he was up in the mountains, wasn't he? <laughs> but we know that the impact, what's called a disparate impact on African American voters and students and other people, poor people, is very real. But whether the courts will turn that enough that we can possibly turn this around
I don't know. Of course, redistricting is a mess, too. You're going to hear about that. But um, uh, it, it is a very sad 180-degree turn of what we were moving towards. We were the most progressive s southeastern state. We were those who cared about, cared about the least of these, who wanted to in, in, increase the franchise. And it's very sad that we have gone this direction. But with you all working very hard, along with these other groups, Democracy North Carolina, and we've got a Durham Ken, which in, a, in an Orange County, Credo is working on it. Of all the people, there's a group in, in Raleigh. And we're hoping that around the state, Obviously, in the urban areas, people are very <coughs> concerned and working hard. We worry about the rural areas. But we thank you because you're going to make a difference. And I hope that we have lots of registration forms here, and Bob has them. And Bob, you can see that, of course, I pass this out everywhere. <laughs> These are all the rules, not just the highlights, everything. And so um, those are our great resource. So thank you very much. Um, I'd be glad to answer questions, but I know that you're going to hear a lot of this in detail. Would you just, if you were going to give any uh, instruction to poll watchers, uh -huh. you're just going to have a great uh, seminar, what would you tell this group of people who are willing to volunteer to be polled? Well, it depends on which side you're on. Uh, <laughs> I would say one of the duties of a poll watcher is to make sure the others do not harass voters. We're worried about that, and Bob probably will talk more about that. We're worried about that. But otherwise, you could be a service. You could say to somebody, to the, you, and you have to go to the judges. You can't just go up to a person and say, I don't think you're in the right precinct, or I don't think you say you are who you say you are. But you could go to the judges and say, I think this person is in the wrong precinct, which actually would be a very helpful move because then what they could do is they say, yes, you are in the wheel check and find out, yes, you are in the wrong precinct, and here's your precinct, and, and it'd be best for you to go there because, you know, they can give a provisional ballot, which they did in the past, and once they confirmed you were a registered voter, then they could count your ballot, not at that point, but later. Now, if you take a provisional ballot, it's thrown in the wastebasket. So you'd be doing a person a big favor to say, I think you're in the wrong precinct. Um, I'm not sure how you could identify somebody who is wrongly. But those are the two things that I think you could do, and maybe Bob can tell you with that, too. Suppose, yeah. you, saw somebody, suppose you saw somebody you. What could you do about it? The judges, uh, the, the precinct officials, they're the ones who would then question the person. And so we don't want citizens doing that, and they're not allowed to do that. They have to go to the officials, and they will there do is that. A, there is an 800 number. There's a helpline, a hotline, right. that everybody should know and, and help you know distribute to people. If you see a problem or if people ask questions and you don't know the answer, you don't need to be an expert. You just get them to call the hotline, and it, it's at the bottom of that little card, 888-VOTE. Um, and 8866R vote also goes to the same number. Um, so there, and there'll be, I mean, we'll talk a little bit in the workshop about an organized poll monitoring project where people can get training and work in teams and, and go to precincts around the state. We did it in the primary, we can do it again in the fall. Yes. I'm Jay Gladio, I'm Common Cause. And that's exactly correct. We, mm. we do a lot of poll monitoring. Uh, monitoring ourselves mm -hmm. and there's always a, a sign with the phone number to call and you know, if you see something you don't you're not necessarily you don't, you don't need to be a policeman you no and you should to, not you should no, not not at all you go you to the election you know, not cause a ruckus at all but just call into the phone number mm -hmm. and and they'll give you the right instructions so mm -hmm. that's exactly correct mm -hmm. thank you yeah and I believe the or not, is there, are the elections board, have they decided that they will put signs up in every precinct that says no photo ID required? Until, I think the elections boards are doing that. Yes, they're supposed that, to. Yes. Uh, so that as you walk up to the polling place, it will say no photo ID required. Until 20. And I hope it's in big letters. 